Um, but it's all good, man. It's all good, bro. We're still blessed, you know. People always have it worse than us. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of that other side of it, though, eh? You kind of, like, I know a lot of people went through it early, but now the world's opening back up for them. It's kind of like, which side would you have taken if you can look back? But mm. who knows, man? Yeah, who knows, bro? Who knows? All right, let's rip it. Hey, looking forward to ripping into it, man. Yeah. All right, yeah. guys. Well, welcome back to the Ice Project. I'm really looking forward to this one. Haven't interviewed someone for a while, and when I thought I'd interview someone again, we really wanted to run it back with this guy here. So roll the intro. Valentin Ozic, hey bro, what's up? What's up, man? Good to see you, bro. All right, good to see you again. Thank you for your time. No worries, bro. No worries. Uh, we're just talking about a little bit about lockdown off air. What's it been like in New Zealand? Uh, it's been, you know, as we said before, a bit of a bittersweet situation. Three kids at home under, you know, I got a 13-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 5-year-old, all different needs, schooling needs. So I'm uh, kind of getting used to this whole thing where I'm a you know professional chef, professional uh, cleaner, professional teacher, uh, professional kind of mentor, um, all that shit on top of running a business and trying to keep my own sanity as well. But besides that, bro, it's all good. <laughs> it didn't sound too good when you just said that. Um, what, does your day, what does your day look like at the moment? Oh, it's, it's a mess, bro. Like you try to have routine, trying to get up early. Obviously, daylight savings started last week, oh, a few days ago. So, um, yeah, try to get up early, win the day, try to get our stuff. But the, the day you try to get up early, your five-year-old decides to get up early as well. So, <laughs> um, But, yeah, it's just kind of like juggling between myself and my wife. But um, I think it's just a bit of a metaphor for life, right? You try to have the plan in place and then a whole bunch of storms and a whole bunch of shit gets thrown at you and it's got to deal with it. Uh, people it was, people always have it worse. It's usually the case too, isn't it? When everything starts to go right and life and business, sort of something comes along, doesn't it? Oh, totally, bro. And if it's not, if nothing, nothing's going wrong or you don't get any fit, curveballs thrown at you, then you should be worried because it's coming. <laughs> 100%, 100%. All right, your boy Dan Hooker, when when at it on the weekend. Um, what's your yeah, relationship bro. with him? Uh, well, I interviewed him on the podcast. Uh, obviously, local cat. Um, I'm a big UFC fan. I didn't actually, um, I was a bit guilty. I didn't actually wa watch a fight live, which I was, which I was gutted about, but yeah, amazing. So I just met him through that and then, um, yeah, just developed a friendship from there. He, um, if you could say, could you speak any more Kiwi? He doesn't like, he's the most Kiwi sounding bloke I've ever heard in my whole life. Oh, for sure, man. For sure. He like epitomizes that humble Kiwi, uh, get shit done. Um, no frills attitude, you know, I love it. That dude's a warrior, man. In terms of like, if, if, if people ask me who was the toughest dude I know, not only just physically, but mentally, I'd say, I'd say Dan Hooker, you know. How big is he? Uh, well, I've got all my brothers are six foot two, six foot four. Um, so I think he's probably around that. Like, I didn't feel like I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite short, like compared to my brothers. Yeah, maybe six foot two. So mm -hmm. not a, not a massive dude, you know. What do you what do you think that's um, obviously your UFC fan, City Kickboxing, big brand in and around the world. What do you think is happening with these boys at the moment with Adesanya and all that, and them boys looking to go overseas? Do you have an opinion on that or what? Yeah, a little bit. Like I've I've, I've kind of you know briefly been reading up on it. I just think that New Zealand has a real fucked up tall poppy syndrome culture, where uh, if anybody does good or anybody's different, you get chopped, and. Um, you know, and I think that since Israel is such an outspoken dude and he's got such a strong mindset, I actually bumped into him in the weekend at Pihar Beach. Um, right. Such a strong, strong mindset. A lot of people don't like that, you know, confidence. Uh, they view confidence as cockiness, but actually but all they are is sure of themselves and their abilities. And I think that, I think that that combined with a, a you know, a successful athlete like himself, people just don't like that, you know. But then, because, you know, we're used to all blacks that are humble, that, like, don't, are not outspoken, but are very scripted about what they can and can't say. And it's such a juxtaposed compared to, say, like, an Izzy, where he's, like, outward, he's doing shit, he's, uh, you know, he's just, he's just different. And people don't like different. Do you reckon that's going to change anytime soon in New Zealand? Or is that just who we are or what? Well, I think, I think we need people like Izzy. We need people like me, need people like you, you know? speak our voice don't be afraid to speak the truth and our truths not necessarily it's not necessarily everybody's truths but i think like people with an opinion out there is is refreshing 
and um and i reckon people that don't have a, an opinion are fucking boring and you just see you see with this whole world we live in at the moment this whole mer- herd mentality everybody just follows everybody just follows follows the pack you know by like that by sheep and i think new zealanders are sheep and uh, i think it just needs to be more people that just go out there and speak what's on their mind obviously not not like you know cutting anybody down but if they want to speak positivity and they want to do stuff to uh you know glorify their own their own successes fuck 100 percent, do it yeah we're, we're a small country man we're doing big things aren't we totally bro 100 percent, man and it makes some um, like the more I'm, i've lived away from new zealand the more i'm proud i am to sort of be from there you know what i mean and now i go back now i'm 32 years old and just driving around and just the way, way that people treat each other man like i didn't see why it's a bad thing that anyone should be shining from there yeah for sure bro for sure so and i'm certainly not man like i know i've uh you know there's yeah i've really kind of changed in the last 12 months in my mindset and yeah i just don't give a crap bro what people think <laughs> i just I, I just clocked in 36 years of age yeah. uh last when was it last friday Thank and you, um yeah na- yeah cheers brother and naturally you kind of reflect on your life and where you're at and I'm at the point, man, where I'm just doing stuff for me, what makes me feel feel good and fills me up. You know, the older you get, I think the more you realize how little you, how little and uh, insignificant it is to waste your time thinking about what other people think about you or other people's opinions. And uh, and then the older you get beyond that, you actually realize that like people got their own shit going on. Oh, so bro. A waste of time, you know? Bro, that's the that's it. I was thinking about that the other week, man. Once you like the older you get and you start talking, like no one really cares if you're super successful or a failure. They always got their own shit going on, bro. You've yeah, yeah. Them. Oh, for sure, bro. And the people that outwardly look like they got their shit together, they don't. Behind closed doors, bro. And like what you know, what's going on, the thoughts are going on between the areas. It's like, man, it's uh it would it would surprise a lot of people, you know. Oh, hundred percent. And obviously Instagram masks, all that as well. And we're two people that have benefited off the back of Instagram with our brands and stuff as well. But yeah. then once you're in it and then around it so much, you can see the other side of it as well. And you can see behind the walls, you can see behind the walls of uh, brands and people, and you can just tell if people are generally happy or not. I've got, yeah. this, I've got this thing right now. Um, I've been on a bunch of podcasts lately and I'm talking about like, I'm trying to live my life one-to-one. So my life mm-hmm. on Instagram and my life in real life is like close to one-to-one as possible. Yeah. We're always going to throw on a bit of like, a filter or try and look good or stuff like that. But besides that, the way I'm acting the way I'm talking, I'm just trying to live one to one at the moment, bro. Yeah, bro, hundred percent. And even me, like I've been pretty inactive on that front for the last twelve months, put on a personal level. You know, haven't done podcasts, haven't posted on the gram. Like I was only on it. Um, I go on it intermittently, probably once every six weeks. I'll just download it, re-download it for a couple of days, get mm. what I want, and delete it again. And it's the same thing, bro. It's just like uh, I just want to. I just want to be the authentic V. I don't want to be. I don't want to, you know, fabricate myself to to look good through the lens of other people. I just want to be me. And uh, my wife really taught me that. She she lives that life. Um, and then it's taken a while for me to adapt it. But fuck it, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do it. Let's dive a little bit deeper on that. You've pulled yourself away from Instagram and social media. How does that affect the mentals creatively and and sort of everything? holistically uh significantly man so firstly you have to you have to go go within to get inspiration and you also don't become uh you know fixated with other people's lives which as it's human tendency to become fixated with other people's lives and then um obviously i feel a lot lot happier i don't get these constant dopamine hits of scrolling and things like that and also my business has just exploded, bro. You know, we've grown 130, 150% in the last 12 months. That's awesome. And uh, that, that's required a lot of cognitive function, like co- cognitive focus. And, um, and I had to be focused, you know what I mean? So I just had to, you know, rebuild a bunch of stuff, you know, people, systems, the product, just for a whole shebang. So, yeah, so it was, a, it, it was almost like a combination of all those, all those things, but um you know the net result i think has been a lot better but at the same time i still feel that i have a moral obligation to teach what i'm learning along the way what's going on between my between my um two ears and i think that you know in this world um god or the universe or whatever has messengers and they uh are put on this earth to almost dissect complex 
fought some com complex theories to uh, in, in, into sim simplistic words for other people to understand and follow. And, uh, and I believe I'm one of those people. And once again, it might sound cocky, you might sound arrogant, but um, I believe it's one of those. I get constant messages all the time. When's the podcast coming back? Where's the content? And this is after a year, you know, and we've had over 150,000 downloads of our podcast and that's not exclude, that's not including listens and I haven't done it for that long. Um, so yeah, I, I, I want to do that. And at the same time, you sharpen your thoughts, your thinking, you become clearer uh, and you grow a shit ton from it as a result of it as well. Shit, might need to get off Instagram, bro. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'm going to dive into a little bit more business stuff today. Um, we sort of touched over the surface and we dived into your journey last time, but I think we'll dive a little bit deeper. How would you describe I Love Ugly to someone that's never heard of I Love Ugly? Um, I Love Ugly is a, uh, like, in real basic, someone that's never heard of it. It's a men's clothing brand, like first and foremost. But at the same time, it's a movement as well. It's like a, it's, it's a mindset. So, you know, uh, when someone buys I Love Ugly, maybe they like it aesthetically. And as they get into the brand, they start liking the mindset and whatnot behind it. So I'd say we, we make dope, good quality clothes at a great price point. Um, and at the same time, we stand for something. You know, we stand for something that, which is to, for people to, you know, we encourage people to chase their dreams. And, you know, it sounds kind of cheesy, but as you dig into it, um, yeah, as people dig into the brand, they'll kind of know, know what we mean by that. And we try, to take, we try to take that cheesiness and make it dope, you know, aesthetically. And I like, oh, yeah, that resonates with me. Yeah, I remember, like, um, obviously, I was a fan of I Love Ugly, purely just got into it because it looked cool. Um, then I obviously started following your social medias and stuff like that. And I always enjoyed those very, like, um, aesthetically pleased. Something about simplicity and the aesthetic, like the slow motion of someone walking in New York and and had a cool beat behind it or had a motiv motivational speech behind it was something that always resonated with me. And I, I thought, that was, fuck, that was cool. But you're doing this, you've been at it 11 years now, is that about right? Uh, yeah, like if you include the three years hustling in my bedroom, it's been about 13 years. Um, so yeah, 13 years, bro. I've been doing it. And like we, we reference some of those points as like inspo points and stuff as well. So, and I'll, like, I'll see a lot of brands coming through now and they, I wouldn't say they look similar, but they do kind of look similar. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah they do. hundred <laughs> percent. So the way that they obviously put their campaign pieces together and their subtle touches, like for me, I just see, I love ugly. Yeah, 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 man. And I think that that's kind of, that's just part and parcel with this game, right? Um, but I think that the mistake people make is they replicate what they, what they can see, but they don't actually try to find beyond what they can't see. And that's actually where all the magic is, you know? Do you want to dive a little bit deeper on that? Yeah, well, it's like in order, and you know this better than anyone, right? In order to bring a product to market, it isn't just like an idea in your head, chuck it on Illustrator, chuck it for spec sheet to the factory and it turns up online for the customer to buy it. It's so much deeper than, than that, man. It's just like, it's like data, it's vibe, it's trend, it's the financing of it, it's the margin of it. Is it, does it fit within the archetype of your customer? It's when is the perfect timing of it? Do I have to see freight it? Do I have to air freight it? How are you actually going to fund that? You know, and you times that by, you know, 10, 10, 10 to 20,000 units per month and you're working, you know, eight, like you've got eight months of, of products at different life, at different stages of the life cycle on the trot. It's a beast, man. It's a complex beast. And that's why for the last 12 months, I've had to kind of like hunker down and help figure that out and, you know, uh, get the right people in the right positions to, to as we go into this next phase of, of, of growth. Cause we've gone from, we've gone from, you know, small bedroom brand, to cool boutique brand, to cool influencers wearing it, to now it's like, yeah, we've got three flagship stores, maybe another store. Um, you know, we're selling, you know, 10, 20,000 units a month. That's a lot of people. And you're no longer a small brand anymore. So therefore you can't behave and think like a small brand. You have to behave and think like a big brand, but at the same time, you still don't want to lose your integrity. And I, that's a difficult juggle. And I think that what I want to achieve is I want to, I want I Love Ugly to be big. And the thing is, I think big is cool and big is harder. It's easy to be small and cool, right? And boutique and this and that. It's hard to be big and cool. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of these big brands have a tendency, as soon as they get big or a certain stage, 
they start doing, they start slipping here and there and they start looking kind of shit and they no longer resonates with anybody. So then therefore they have to start competing on price. It's like, how do I make this thing as cheap as possible? So any man and his donkey can start wearing it. But uh, we don't want to do that. We want to do the other. We want to go big, maintain quality, maintain the integrity of the brand, the spirit of the brand. And, uh, and at, the same, at the same time, use it as a vehicle to influence as many people as we can. I'm glad you sort of brought that up because that's the point where we're sort of at now too, where like um, we've got people coming through and go, oh, you can do this and you, you'll get this amount of money. And obviously when you see that type of money come through and I've never been motivated by money, I'm sure you're the same just, just by the way that you speak. Um, I can see why brands move towards that direction. You know what I mean? It's like that yeah. store that you go to and it's a vibe early and, and everyone sort of goes there. Now they start to scale out. You go to the one in the other suburb and the coffee's not as good and, and the eggs Benny aren't as good. And yeah. It's a problem of scale, isn't it? Absolutely, bro. Um, and kind of touching your point on, on money, like, and I think we spoke about this last podcast, there's nothing wrong with money, but I think that if you do something that's true to yourself and you think a little bit more long-term, money become, money is a result, is a side effect of that, you know? And it may come a little bit longer. It may take a little bit longer, but, um, but I think when it does come, it's sustainable, it's more fulfilling. Rather than just chasing the next shiny thing or the next trend in order to make a quick buck, if you do that, man, you're just going to be doing all these short sprints and you just gas out. And, um, and that's why we see so many brands and so many influencers and so many you know, social spokespeople coming onto the scene and they disappear after a few months because it's hard yakka and they're doing shit that doesn't actually fulfill them by doing stuff to get big, to get famous, to get hype, to get, you know, chase money. And you just burn out, bro. Oh, hundred percent. Um, so you say you've sort of grown 120, 150% over the last 12 months. Last time we've caught up, what's one thing that you've doubled down on and what's one thing that you've dropped in that time? Uh, what well, we've doubled down on, we've really focused on the product, like really focused on it. Um, so that's not one thing that we've doubled down on. So I've now, I've got like a, I'm building out like a proper design team. Prior to 12 months ago, I was doing it solo in terms of the actual design. Yes, I had influence and, and uh, I had all the data and all the kind of skeleton, um, you know, given to me for me to, for me to do the products. But now I'm building out a design team. Uh, so I've got Amanda, my assistant. She's amazing. So she's worked at, you know, she, she's had a lot of experience offshore, 10 years offshore. You know, her last job was at Supreme New York and she got, she was one of the first to get let go after, um, after COVID in, in New York. So she's just got like a wealth, wealth of experience and stuff like that to help me. And basically for me, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make it so I'm not as on the tools but I can kind of see the view from above and I can begin pulling, pulling strings. So uh, in, 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 in order for our product to you know, elevate to the next level, I need to be doing it. I need to be stepping away more and then viewing it from, from up above, almost from a view of the customer, but still I've got one foot on what's going on in the engine room. And, uh, and with product comes all the other logistical side of it, you know, our, our planner, like we've kind of split the roles. So we've got like a full, full-time focused demand planner. Cause it's like right now you've got, you know, 30,000 plates spinning at the same time. You've got, you know, poor congestions, you've got um, cotton, cotton uh, inflation in, in China. You've got all this, you know, the government shutting down factories because of power consumption. Like you've got a whole bunch of stuff, you know? Mm. And I think if you're not, and the, the, the thing is, it's like, product in the fashion business is the currency. And the thing is, if you're not getting your currency right, you've got no business. So we've just been focusing on our currency. That's awesome. It's a good way to look at it. Um, this kind of flows nicely into the next topic I've got down here is idea to execution. And how far do you plan out? Can we talk about this whole design process, bro? So obviously, you pl are you planning out six to eight months ahead? I've seen you put April yeah. not too long ago. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do you operate purely off data? Do you save some wiggle room for fashion or you're trying to move the brand forward? You're a brand that's always use fun fabrics on five panel hats and subtle touches within pockets and stuff. Um, how does this flow for you? Where does this, where's the start point? Obviously you've got a design team now. How do you pass that on to them? And then how do you get it in store? Yeah, so first and foremost, yeah, so we're planning right now, we're just finishing up June, 2022. 
So we're actually, that's probably classified as um, like short, you know, a lot, of, a lot of brands are longer than that. Well, it's mainly because they're stuck in the old model of like wholesale and distribution. Uh, so we're a little bit shorter. We actually want to go, we actually don't want to be designing so far out either. So that way we've got way more flexibility. Um, but yeah, we're, so we're, so what, what's that? We're September, October, October, November, December, January, February, March. April. Yeah. So that's like what, five, six, seven months out. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, we've got the demand planner. This is what we need. Give it to the design. We already kind of know we've got, you know, 13 years now of, of data and we take notes every year about the month so we can look back retrospectively. So we know what we missed, what we overdid. Uh, what we don't need and what we do need. And we just look at those notes combined with like what's happening with the trends, what's our aesthetic. And the thing is, is right, right now we just, you know, we're classic menswear with a twist. We don't want to be, you know, we do a few fashion stuff there and there, but we don't want to be chasing that stuff because it's exhausting. So we pretty much like, it's pretty much like a renewal, fresh seasonal renewal of a lot of stuff that we've done before, but still slightly evolving to keep it exciting and keep the customers coming back. And um, yeah, once we do that, just sample processes, sam sample stages comes through, make the tweaks, get the product, and then repeat. It's yeah. not like it's not like it's not rocket science, but obviously, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not rocket science. But there is a fine art to it, isn't there? There is a very fine art, and the thing is, is like what recipe works for one business may not work for the other, okay. um, for for a number of reasons. You know what I mean? It's like uh, the conditioning of the customer, the expectation, the gap you're filling in the market, all that stuff. Like you got to, uh, you got to kind of make the recipe, tweak the recipe to your own. And when you talk about tweaking recipes, do you want to talk about that from a clothing standpoint? Is that garment doing different colors? Is it different shapes? I know you guys moved into a lot of box um, tees at the moment and oversized, which is kind of on trend at the moment. What are those subtle touches? Yeah, just like constantly looking at asking yourself, how can we do this better? You know what I mean? Not getting complacent, uh, subtle tweaks. You also got to remember is like when you're in the game, you are, you're thinking 12 months, 24 months ahead in terms of trends. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is like, there's that, there's that thing where you can do the right thing, but if you do it in the wrong time, it's the wrong thing, oh. you know? <laughs> and, uh, I want to touch on that a little bit more um because oh I, I got taught about like a sort of a fashion trend um probably about halfway through the game where i've been in for like four or five years now and we dropped the color like a little bit too early and you're just sitting on way too much product i think you had a similar example with your kobe pant with the yeah bro yeah always like we've always always got examples of that it's uh you know you think it's going to be a success but it's not and then you kind of hold your you know, hold steady. And then it, for whatever reason, it starts to become a success after six months. Um, or you have something that's like, man, I'm over this. We've been doing it for five years. Yeah, it still continues to uh, pay dividends, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's just like, that's that whole thing about, it's simple, but it's also, it's quite difficult because you have to have your finger on the pulse. You have to have a, a fantastic team uh, and you have to constantly be reviewing that stuff. Because the thing is, is like, if you don't, if you're not reviewing all the stuff, like the little things are going to start to become Godzilla's. And then before you know it, you've got big problems on your hands. And like a little bit, there's a little bit of ego in there sometimes as well that you've always got to manage. Like when you start to get really good sales, like you have and we have, you start to start thinking, oh, I can do something else better. But a lot of the time for us, 82% of our product, um, our sales are hood, hoods and t-shirts. And yeah. that we start to move away from that. And I know you guys are big into pants and like I look at, I used to look at you guys and Zane Robe and all these types of brands for like panting, but for us, yeah. it just doesn't work for us. And yeah, there was a couple of years I kept trying to push it and kept trying to push it, but it's just not our thing, is it? And then yeah, bro, it's that like balance, bro, it's it's hard. Oh, bro, you've got uh, you got brands and their things are shorts or their thing is shirts or hats. Like that's what I'm saying, man. It's just like everybody's got. That's why the recipe has to be kind of unique to you. Uh, can't be applied to you know, what works for I Love Ugly may not work for this brand or that brand or what works for you may not work for us, you know? Um, so we're going to talk about sort of collection breakdowns. A lot of people don't really dive into this too much. How much of it, how much of it is a core and how much of it is trying to move uh, brands forward? And I'm probably going to ask you like a personal question. Like we're a brand that we're dropping hoodies at the moment, bro, and they're selling out so quick. And mm -hmm. is, is the 
should I be going wider or should I be going deeper? Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, in terms of like colors. Oh, colors. Um, probably about three to four per drop and we're dropping fortnightly at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'd, I'd say that like, I just, obviously that formula is working, bro. Yep. Like uh, I wouldn't kind of tamper with it too much to the point where you like flip it, you do a hundred percent change. Just mm. do those little 10%, 5% tweaks, add a few more colors, add some prints, add some collabs, you know, all that type of stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. And what was the other, what was the other question? What a collection breakdown. So when you look at your month, so you're dropping April or whatever you're dropping, like what does that collection breakdown look like for you guys? How much of it is a core product? How much is a top versus bottoms? What does that look like for you guys? Yeah. It's a bit. It's, it's a bit of a mixture because the thing is, is like core, core something that's classified as core, which for the viewer, viewers are probably thinking, what the hell does core mean? <laughs> it just means like a product that you always have in stock, essentially. Um, but what I, the way we view it is, it's like a core item. What we deem as core may only be core, quote unquote, core, core for say like twelve months as opposed to two years. Mm. So it, it may be something that you sell a lot of, but maybe only for the next 12 months and then you cut it and then you replace it with something else. But um, honestly, bro, it's like ever evolving. And I think that the moment that we started to become very, uh, very like super structured in the sense where we need 10 like of these hoods and five of these and these don't go out of stock. We actually started to get into trouble as well because complacency kills the cat. And I think with fashion is uh, people still want that, they still want that progression and they still want, they still want the trend, but they still want the old. And it's just a bit of a kind of fine balancing act. And I think that, um, yeah. So for us to answer your question in terms of percentage of what's core, what's new, I actually couldn't even answer that right now. 12 months ago, it was probably 80% core, like the mm. same stuff that we've been repeating for years. But the thing is, is like, if you keep doing it, eventually that's going to start to run its course. And the thing is, if you've got a shit ton of product or a shit ton of money tied up in a product that's run its course, you're either going to have to discount it, you probably would discount it, and, uh, and that, that capital could be allocated elsewhere and sort of, more efficiently. Sort of to roll back on that old question about the Kobe pants, even though that you know they're going to be coming into um, style soon, especially for a place like New Zealand, or I know you're a global brand right now, but you're probably a month early. Do you, do you sell that item or do you just put it on ice? Cause you know, it's going to come good later or how does that work with, with I love just, just hold it, man. I think that, um, you know, what we realized in that kind of bell curve of trends. And I think Malcolm Glowell talks about this is you've got, you've got the, you've got the influences, you've got the early adapters, you've got the, um, you know, late adapters, and then you've got the, I, I think it's like that. I don't know. I can't, people probably like, oh, what's that guy talking about? But it's essentially like you've got a few people in the beginning that, that, that basically pick up on whatever you're doing. And I'm, I'm not just talking fashion, I'm talking any, any, anything. And they influence the early adapters, and then the early adapters influence the mass market or the middle, the late, later or early or middle adapters or whatever. And the thing is, is that process takes time, but there's no given or there's no exact formula as to how long it takes. Do you know what I mean? Because at the same time, some stuff from the get go, whatever it may be, just gets picked up. And it's usually the stuff that solves a problem or scratches a niche that's needed out in the market. And, um, and then there's some stuff where it's just like, oh, I'm on point. Uh, I'm going to release this product or release this. And this can be applied for everything, not just fashion, any product in the market. Mm -hmm. And you put it and it doesn't buy it, or maybe a few people buy it. I think it's important to hold, but I think it's also important not to like put all your eggs in that basket in the hopes that eventually it's going to become mass market because that's not very smart business acumen. Um, yeah, for us, we, uh, for us, we, yeah, we do a few little drops. And if it bites, then we do quick, you know, re-injections and then you increase it like that. Um, there's a great book, the Zara book, which I'd recommend to read for anyone. The cord book? It's just, I think it's called the Zara book. <laughs> I'll write that down. Pretty, pretty memorable. <laughs> it's a weird name. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, bro. Yeah, so it's just the founder of Zara and about how we built it. And uh, it's epic, bro. Like pretty impressive. He was the richest man in the world for a little bit, wasn't he? Yeah, man. Still up there, I'd say top 10, top five. He's got yeah. a quick to market, um, like it's kind of fast fashion too. So basically his business model was like you could see it on the runway and then have it in store within a month, wasn't it? Yeah, two weeks, man. Yeah, quicker. 
that so he built, he built the whole supply chain exactly for that and it wasn't an external it was all part of their own under their own yeah under the same roof as, as the zara brand so yeah it's hectic man it's crazy Sweet, we'll be picking that up today. All right, going to be talking about social media and marketing. You've been in the game for 13 years. How much things, how much have things changed and how much have things stayed the same within it? I know there's probably some core principles of marketing. I've heard you do a speech maybe at AUT about it when you're talking about the rings and how you guys got in trouble and stuff like this. And I know you tap into marketing quite a bit. How much has it changed and how much has it stayed the same? I think it's changed now where it's harder. Um, in the sense where it's a it's a cluttered marketplace you know there's a shit ton of people now doing it than they were two years ago even six months ago um but at the same time it's a bit of a paradox because it's also easier so there's more information about how to hack it how to crack it um but then on the flip side it's harder because it's more saturated yeah, but I think it, yeah yeah but i think it's that whole thing bro like and you, you'll know this because you do this. It's like the authenticity and making your life to what you actually present one-to-one. So making it real. And the thing is, is like, everybody's got a story, right? It's like my daughter, she's, uh, she's like into surfing and art and all this stuff. And she wants to start a YouTube channel and she's so confused about what it wants to be. And she's like, oh, should I make it like about cakes and all this stuff? And I was like, Bella, you don't even bake. So why the fuck would you, I didn't say fuck, but why would you do a YouTube channel about cakes? Yeah. Do it about what you do and your life. And the thing is, is what I said earlier in the podcast is human beings are curious creatures and we're always going to be interested about what's going on in the other, other person's life. And the thing is, if you, if you can create, curate, uh, say your social, depending on what you want to do based off that, but also having the aesthetic and, 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 and a little bit of value that makes it interesting, I mm-hmm. think there's always going to be an audience of it. And the thing is, it's like, at the same time, it's like that thing with like people picking up, picking up trends and whatnot, it may take time. And I think is time, the time is your, when you, the longer you stick something out, you're just basically making little deposits, you know, into your, into your equity bank, your brand equity bank. And the longer you do that, eventually that's going to compound. And eventually a lot of people are going to, going to kind of cotton on to it. That's my theory anyway. Obviously, I haven't really been practicing what I'm preaching right now. But um, but the thing is, is like I know that, say, if I applied all this information, what I'm just spitting now into my own, I know that it will work. Because the thing is, is like it's 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 true. Like you know, be authentic, be interesting, be genuine. Um, do the freak. It's all it's all about the frequency as well. It's like, it's like building. It's important, isn't it? And I know you've sort of been off social, but frequency is important. People want a hundred percent. Yeah. And I think it's a fine balance as well. There's also like over, you can overcook it. You can undercook it. You can overcook it. So it's just like finding that real balance about what works, what resonates. And also like, what's the point of doing a hundred posts a day? Say like Gary V talks about if you're going to be burnt to the bone, and you've got no energy to like apply to your life or, you know, or building your business. Um, Cause people don't, people don't realize that social media is actually an exchange of energy as well. Isn't it? A lot of the time totally, times, people will be looking on their phone for an hour and jump off and go, Oh, but I wonder why I'm tired. Cause that's an exchange. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's exhausting, bro. And the thing is, it's like when you get those constant little dopamine bursts and dumps in your brain, mm. that's not good, man. It's not healthy. And we've gone from, uh, you know, we've gone from an era where, say, like my old man or whatever, he'd probably get a dopamine hit. He doesn't even have a smartphone, doesn't even use a computer. It's crack up. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's gone from genuinely getting a dopamine hit from like going to watch All Blacks and he's like amped up to go to it with all his mates and stuff on a Saturday night. Uh, like that's how he gets his dopamine to now where people and kids can get that exact same dopamine hit 100 times a day. Mm. At, the, at the flick of a button on demand and, uh, on demand and it's not healthy man like it's definitely not healthy too much of something good is not healthy too much sex too much positive thinking I you know, from have too much water can you yeah exactly bro <laughs> too much good food you know makes you fat makes you sluggish makes you feel gross you know so yeah. it's uh it's just finding that balance man and life's all about balance bro I heard someone, positive I heard- it's in negative. I heard someone sort of talk about that um, disease actually comes from abundance. So yeah, totally. Bro. 
And so it does make sense, doesn't it? Yeah, it makes complete sense. Um, so social media from a I Love Ugly standpoint, how far are you guys planned out in terms of like photo shoots? I know you've always kept your aesthetics super clean. You use similar models all the time. Um, what's the strategy behind pre-launch for something like I Love it for, for you guys? Yeah, it's uh, to be honest, it's something I'm not even involved in nowadays. Um, I haven't been involved for about 12 months. But it's essentially we do the two drops a week and then they just, they just pre-plan it on Trello and uh and they just run with it so what you see what you see is and and, and now working probably about two weeks out yep but uh we want to start adding a bit more flavor to there a bit more brand content which has been missing you know that's the heart and the soul of a brand and i think that i think that if you want to become big which we do you have to uh you have to um be really solving almost solving a problem in people's lives that isn't just clothing even, and it's an emotional problem because the thing is if you solve an emotional problem in people's lives they become emotionally connected to you and that's when they evolve, that's when they'll buy buy more than they need because they want to because it makes them feel a certain way and um and you know in this life we get rewarded for solving problems we actually don't get rewarded for working hard everybody works hard most people work 40 hour weeks you know um but the thing is it's like if you're not solving a problem it's only going to get you so far you know, we get, it's all about value cre creation in this world. And I think that's where people get it twisted. So, you know, society teaches us, I'm, I'm kind of going on a bit of a rant here, but let's go. I, said, bro, right. I, haven't, I haven't podcasted in a year. I've got a lot. No, of let's, let's get the rant going, bro. <laughs> you know, society teaches us to be a cog in the wheel and to fit within this cookie cutter existence. Whereas actually it's like, you know, to get a job, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it but it doesn't teach us to think. It doesn't think up, teach us how to solve problems. It doesn't teach us how to ask. It doesn't teach us how to like, how to, how to add value to, to, to this world and people's lives. And the thing is, is like, once you figure that shit out, man, it's like you live in abundance, man, because the thing, and you'll get rewarded for it, both financially, spiritually, uh, people around you, you become infectious. Like people want to be around that because uh, you, you, you radiate that difference. And it's that thing right back with Izzy, man. Like he knows this, he figures this out. This is the secret. You know, people ask, people are always asking for what's the secret to this? What's the secret to that? All the secrets are there, but they're all found in books. But nobody can be bothered picking up a book. You know, if people spend as much time uh, working on themselves, on their body, on their business, as they did on social media and Netflix, they'd all be millionaires with six pack abs, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, bro. I love that. Fuck. Need that rant. Need to get back podcasting, bro. <laughs> yeah, bro. Hard out. All right. Fuck. This kind of rolls perfectly into leadership. Um, I'm in the spot now. Probably last time I talked to you, I would have had about two staff. I'm sitting on about six to eight here and there. Looking for some part time as well. Um, it's something I, it changes from day to day with me. Some days I'm, I'm like this. Some days I'm like that. Um, how how do you deal with leadership, and how are you dealing with it now? I think so. Basically, leadership is um, you require a different leadership hat depending on the different stage you are in your business and your own life. And like I think that. You're probably at a stage now where, sorry, it's just, but give me one sec, right? I've got to turn this heater off. <laughs> um, you're, you're, you're at a stage now where, uh, you know, you're going from everything that revolved around you. You did, you did the, you know, you're the spokesman of the brand. You did the production. You're doing the business meetings. You're meeting with the accountant. You're approving the samples. You're doing the photo shoots. You everything. And then you go to eight people. And now it's like a bit of a different kind of different leadership role. Like you've got, you have to, you have to have a, uh, you have to have a vision. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So that way people can actually make decisions without you being in the room. And the thing is, if you've got a strong vision, people can then probably make a similar decision to you because they know why they're doing it. It's like, all right, I'm not going to do this because Isaac said, this is the vision. And the thing is, if I make the decision, my decision making is pretty easy because I got to make the decision what's going to get me closer to the vision. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then I, I think my leadership style is I'm a very hands off dude in terms of like, I'm not operationally minded and it exhausts me. It depletes me. And the thing is, is like the way probably this is a, this is probably like, this is a little golden principle that's helped me a lot. It's like, 
look for people that can make your personal life easier and make the company stronger. Honestly, if you just start to ask yourself that, and it's like, what do I want to do? What don't I want to do? What I don't want to do, give it to somebody else that's super enthusiastic about that thing because they're going to do it a thousand times better than you. And if you've got that in every arm of, of the business and, you, and, and, and you've like allocated, you know, you, you basically, you know, orchestrated this group of people that are on point with your vision, your personal vision of a brand, and are also doing stuff that you suck at or don't want to do or don't have the time to do, but are passionate about it, you're going to be a force to reckon with, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, um, and all businesses really is an allocation of capital and also orchestrating a group of people towards a, a greater vision. That's all it is really. And it's just figuring out how to do that. Once again, sounds simple. Yeah, it's kind of simple. Like, yeah but my, yeah, that's what I said before. My job is to take complex ideas and make it simple for people. And um, I'm just trying to make it super simple because a lot of people are like, a lot of people are like, oh, I'll do a product. I'll just fucking run out there like a madman and try to do it with no actual thought and intent behind it as to why they're doing it and how they're going to do it. And, and also like, the most precious thing we have on this earth is time. And mm-hmm. I think also like we're all gifted with, we're all gifted with like things that we're really good at. So why would you spend 80% of your time doing the stuff that you hate that sucks up all your time and depletes you at the end of the day? It makes no logical sense. So your, your job is to be freed up to do what you're passionate about and what you're great at. And then, and then, you know, distributing the rest to the other people couple of the things that I've sort of noticed while I've been in here and I know like you don't like to micromanage and technically I don't like to, but I'm happy to call things out when I see it. But pretty early on, I was just like, oh shit, I'm paying you X amount. Therefore you should be doing this amount of time. That was kind of one of the mistakes I was making early on. And we've Mm -hmm. just talked about being paid for your value and not your time. And I've sort of found once, like once you've done your job, like sort of go home, cruise, or go work on yeah, something else, or go for a run. And it's kind of a weird enigma because sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm just going, oh, I can't believe I'm paying for <laughs> <Do you, laughs> But that ever go through your mind and stuff like that? Oh, of course, man. And I think that, I think that um, you nailed it before. It's just like, it's like, you don't want doers. You know what I mean? You don't want people busy being busy. You want people that are actually making progress towards things. And the thing is, it's like, if you've got someone that's like works 30 hours, but gets you significantly closer to your outcome, which is why outcomes are so important, bro, 10, 10 hours, if they fuck around and all good, like that's, that's fine. And, um, and you get to a stage where you get to a stage where you start to distinguish the good people from the bad people. And I also think that sometimes, you know, the, the good people are more expensive. Like we know that like hard, like people that aren't good but cheaper and they're harder to get rid of like we know that as well a lot of people were like oh i'm going to i'm going to pay this person for 60 grand cuz uh 30 grand cheaper than this person little do they know that 30 grand's probably costing them maybe quarter of a million dollars they just don't know it yet it hasn't eventuated so it's just like making sure that you you know spend your time spend your time like figuring these things out and then also a one, one, one little trick I do with, uh, with hiring people, what we've done, which has served me well, because our staff turnover at I Love Ugly, especially in the head office and in the stores, like stores are a little bit different. Um, like we haven't had, we had one, like since COVID last year, we had one guy that left because we caught, because we uh, made, we shut down wholesale and we had one guy in the warehouse leave because he was, you know, doing uh, illegal stuff. Uh, but in terms of like people, stealing from you? yeah, stealing, you know, I didn't want to say it, but, <laughs> but, um, you know, and the reason being is because like when we hire people, it's like, you can have five people that all have the skills and they've got the pretty CV. But the thing is, it's like, we look for the people and their mindset stands out. How do they deal with adversity? How do they deal with calamity? What is their purpose? Like I asked people, I was like, what do you, what do you get up for? And, in, 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 in this like, like, why do you get up in the morning? If money wasn't a thing, what would you be doing? And the thing is, is like when you kind of challenge them and stump them in the interviewing process based on these questions, the ones that really embrace it and love it and light up are the ones that you want on board, you know? 
Oh, that's crazy. That's really good. I've never really had to interview anyone. So with so I reckon you should, you should like, you're at a point now where you need to carefully pick the right people. Cause you've got a small team and yep. small teams are actually pretty, they're very, they're, they're amazing, man. Cause it's like, it's very delicate. It's like family, like, but you they all want to be singing from the same song sheet as you, as you, as the founder, you know what I mean? Mm. The thing is, if you get one, one bad, you know, one bad apple spoils, spores the batch it's like it's so true man with this one bad person can be cancerous to your culture and your business and um you want people that are that are on board with what who you are and what you want and what you find important and it's all in the mindset man like mindset obviously the skills are important um but so much of the skills can come off a right mindset and you're at a you're you're at a position where it's like you went from one or two people to eight people so what's that? That's like a 400, 500%, whatever it is, increase in staff. If that continues, man, holy shit. Imagine if you've got 16 people, but then they're all, they've all got the wrong mindset. They're all on different pages. You know, it's, you, you, yeah, you, you, it goes you're a pretty quick, full, hey. full-time firefighter, bro. And it's people that build the business. It's not the product. It's not the founder. It's people. All the founder's job is to actually, you know, assemble the right team. You know, that's that's the job of a founder. You just sort of point them in the right direction too, isn't it? Yeah, bro. You're the sailor of the ship, man. <laughs> um, the what gives you the greatest kick out of leadership? For me, it's kind of like hiring people and getting them away from jobs that they necessarily didn't like before. And I like I love topping people up with pay rises and stuff. Like that honestly gives me a kick. What's it for you? Yeah, I, I like those those things too. Um, I like to figure out what makes somebody tick and then also um, almost like carving out a part of the business where they can, you know, they can do that thing that makes them, that wakes them up, you know, that, that drives them. And that's why it's so important to figure out what does make people tick and what their different personalities are. Cause you, you know, you've got introverts, you've got extroverts, you've got people that are under pressure and they just like seize up and they don't tell you until they implode. And you've got people that, you know, they're like the squeaky wheels and they get over oil and they, as soon as they got a problem, they just like, I'll, I'll voice it and not, not going to be, you know? but for me, yeah, for me, it's like, it's just dope like to uh, share goals and, and, and celebrate goals together and milestones. That's what I love, man. It's just like, we all like, you know, go every Friday, the first Friday of every month, we all have lunch and we just like reminisce on the month prior and, just have a good, good laugh. And, you know, and I, I love those moments, man. And I love like achieving a, a goal that you celebrate it mutually as opposed to just to yourself or just to your business partner. Um, that's epic for me, man. And seeing people grow, like, honestly, there's people in, in the company and I've seen them grow and it's been, it's been phenomenal. You know what I mean? Just watching them, not only in their, in their business, but also in their personal lives, just like they just grow up quick. I, I love seeing that, man. I, I kind of force books onto everyone and around us. Um, we do sort of online lists, uh, like classroom sessions and stuff now. So, man, that stuff's like, like you said, um, beats. I know we've had some pretty great sales days, and I'm sure you have as well. Yeah. And seeing that stuff is, is much more fulfilling and, and lines up, um, fills up the heart more than anything else. Yeah, bro. It's cool, man. It's epic. Yeah. It's what it should be. Um, so, you said you hired someone that worked at Supreme, which is fucking. The elite of streetwear brands, what lessons has she taught you? Or what have you learned from a big brand like that that she's brought into I Love Ugly? Uh, you know, Supreme, I think it sold for 2.1 billion. I think annual sales were maybe half a billion. And uh, despite those sales that they rack up on the board, they are a small team. Do you know what I mean? Oh, cool. Uh, she said they are like, the head office was like maybe 15 or 20 people, oh. which is small, man. Which goes to show, you know, it, like you get to a point and it's not really about how many people you have in the office. And it's just like, don't get, not getting caught up in vanity metrics. It's like, oh, I've got 50 people in the off, head office. It's all about, it's all about the kind of, it's a different, it's a different beast at that point. It's all about like the stock ordering, you know, it takes the same amount of resource to create, say, a thousand units of something as it does to 20,000 because you've done all the branding, you've done all the design, you've done all the ideation and, and the thought behind it. And then it's more of a manufacturing thing. Yep. Um, yeah. So that, that, that's small, man. And everything, all the decisions go through the creative director. So James Jibby, the founder. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, so he's still hands on of everything. Very hands on, super That's hands on. Great. I like that. Yeah. yeah, and then also they outsource a lot of ideas as well. So uh, if I'm not this design, mach- sorry, um, advertising machine where everything comes through their headquarters, it's actually outsourced. So they've got like a they've got like a group of people that they use from different you know different industries and whatnot, and they do like they outsource the campaigns and the photo shoot campaigns, which keeps things re- really fresh. And um and then uh and then she also said that the uh like the actual processes and stuff within is still pretty. I'm not like super. It's not super corporate. It's still kind of quite independent feel and vibe to it, which is which is quite cool. And then apparently they are like that. Their snack cupboard is amazing. Like you think it would be all like junk food, but it's like kombucha and roasted almonds and um dehydrated seaweed and. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, which was Fiji water. Like I was pretty surprised about that. I thought it would just be like candy and sugar, and mm. and apparently all these dudes within actually take care of their health. So I found that pretty fascinating. Like I've just got right right behind there. I've just got a fridge full of beer too. So you're making me feel bad, bro. Yeah, bro. Might have to <laughs> burn it, burn it, man. Donate what, it. What do you reckon makes Supreme so cool? Um, that authenticity, bro. Like uh just authentic bro like they haven't you know they just got bought out but if you didn't know that news would you know probably not you know it's not like they're all of a sudden like doing all this like yeah cheesy stuff that's not supreme all of a sudden i think the authenticity that's the that's the thing all right so i'm gonna move into a little bit i know you sort of dived into nfts quite early um crypto chat where do you in the Anyone listening, it's not financial advice for anyone. Where do you sit? We'll start with crypto. Where do you sit on crypto right now? Are you investing or what? Yeah, yeah. I've got like, uh, what I've got, like 50 grand in there. And um, it's like a, it's like it goes up and then down, up and down. <laughs> to, to be perfectly honest, uh, I was telling Jackson uh, on, on email, it's like I've kind of been out of that space for probably the last four months. Yep. Purely because of focus. And, uh, it was so volatile. I became addicted to checking, you know, how my portfolio position, like on a 12 times a day, probably 25 times a day basis. Hmm. It was, uh, it was distracting, man. And then it, and it, and it alters your moods. It affects your moods. And the thing is, it's like, we know that as a businessman, if you can't manage your moods and emotions, you're going to make poor, poor decisions. So I basically eliminated everything that was like, you know, affecting my mood. So I just, I didn't delete my portfolio. I just deleted the app off my phone. I just didn't check it. Same with the NFTs. And the thing is, is like crypto, I think it's great. Um, it's still obviously super volatile. Uh, I'm actually considering maybe just taking, taking it out for the time being and just putting it into something way better like property. Mm. Um, yeah. But at the same time, like pr- crypto is not my primary. It's yeah. more of my fun money. And um, I've got like I'm I'm investing into into property. Uh, that's what I've been doing. And um, I think it's just like you know I've got a I've got a property that's already gone up you know significantly and it's not even built yet. And um, and that's real money. You know what I mean? And the thing is, is like you can borrow against that. You can leverage that. And that's the only thing with crypto. Like I know you can. I know you can leverage and things like that. But it's uh you can't do you can't do the big numbers to build serious wealth. And I think it's a very p- important piece to have in your portfolio but yep. it shouldn't be the only piece i think it's dangerous because the thing is it's like if you are um you know like if you're comfortable with losing you know if you if you're comfortable with like a like a 200 percent swing in a day like cool so i'd say just to invest with caution and do it so um if you lose this money it's not going to sink a boat your your children aren't going to starve yeah, no. that's the important part, isn't it? You, you, it's a little, little play around money that you're sort of putting in. And I'm quite big into crypto at the moment, and I'm yeah. also different opinions on it. But I feel like them, some of them swing days early on, like you said. Oh, yeah, bro. Like, oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really gone, but it's only like, I'm in it for a long term. I'm in here for 10 years. So obviously. Totally, bro. And that's, and that's it, right? Like different strokes for different folks. I'm in a bit of a different stage in my life where, um, you know, just, just got a few things and, it, nothing's right nothing's wrong yep bro you might be you might be the you might have a billy you know you might be a billionaire <laughs> uh, and, and i'll be like fuck i should have listened to isaac you know <laughs> uh, we only time will tell but yeah man i reckon it's fantastic i'd just say that um 
make sure you ed- educate yourself hey eh? like much you yourself. Stuff yeah. on your brain on your mind on your morning routines on business that's one of those things as well that you need to be diving into and 100 bro in 100 yeah. hours learning before you start spending money in it as well yeah um, i agree man and then it gets becomes a point where like you have to start you have to eventually start uh, a lot of people are starters and not researchers mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people are researchers and they never start i think it's a balance you have to do as you said do your 20 hours, 100 hours, and just begin, and just begin a little bit. And the thing is, is like a lot of it is the emotional management of things. Mm. And you've got to learn to, uh, you got to learn to manage your emotions. And yeah, and that's why it's, yeah, you got, and the only way you can really learn that, no matter how many books you read on it, you've got to actually learn by doing it. Mm. A little bit of advice, not financial advice, but I'll probably hold this last little quarter. It usually rolls in four year cycles that were at the end yeah. of the fourth year. So it's meant to go up this next little period. So maybe hold to it. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, I heard uh yeah, I know. That's what uh that's what Willie said as well. Yeah, yeah, like, hold it, hold it, bro. So yeah. Uh, so this NFT space, did you see Bobby Hundreds dropped his NFT? Have you looked yeah. in, around there? Well look, I, I had a bunch of material that I was supposed to read and I'm still yet to read, but I heard it was a massive success. Mm, do you see that any way for all of like, obviously your digital like creator you know what i mean it's, it's your yeah man 100 percent, doesn't it yeah yeah we uh we, we we've been talking about it for about eight months or so about the what what we're gonna do um we just haven't really got around to it and i think honestly just this this period of business it's just like it's all consuming um do you know what i mean it's like building out new supply chains and things like that and uh, just focusing, making sure that the main thing is the main thing. Like, uh, it's very easy to chase shiny things. Oh, that's and usually, uh, yeah. <laughs> shiny things can be distracting as well, but 100%, bro, it'll probably be uh, like, where we do or do, don't do it, I don't know. But I think it will, you know, obviously have some, would love for it to have some utility. Um, I think it's dope. And I think a lot of people are doing it. Uh, I've got, I, I own some NFTs, I've brought, spend a lot of money on NFTs. I've sold NFTs. I still hold <laughs> NFTs. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are doing it for a quick, quick win, quick buck. A lot of them are making some quick wins, especially like celebrities and whatnot. Um, but then there's ones that are doing it like, you know, say like the Gary V's where one NFT will be worth a hundred. It's worth a hundred grand now, you know? Crazy. And, uh, Crazy. Yeah. Did you own, did you get one of those? Uh, that's, that's one of my, it's probably my only regret. Like I don't have too many regrets and I'm a Gary yeah. V guy, bro. I dive into all yeah, this. Yeah. I'm stuff. surprised about that. I just didn't have enough ETH at the time because, um, and I was just sort of like chipping away slowly. Obviously, yeah. I would have enough to buy some now, but he's, I think he's relaunching again next Feb. So I'll be lining up, but the floor price is going to be pretty high. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I just don't want to lose ETH at the moment because I'm just like, I don't have enough of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. I know. Just more of it as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be cool. I can, I don't think yeah. there's enough adoption of crypto in New Zealand and Australia. So imagine if we go, hey guys, go set up a MetaMask. We're going to sell a I Love Ugly NFT or YKTI NFT. I don't think people would know what MetaMask is. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's pretty interesting, eh? Like I put a, because when I put an NFT post up on my personal Instagram, whenever it was, man, I was, I was, I, I'd never got so much like feedback and DMs from a, from a post than I had from that. And a lot of it was curiosity. Like people were curious, like a lot of people have heard of it, but no one really spoken about it. And then um, I think that I know, I, I personally know a lot of people in the space. It just hasn't become commercial yet. Even though it's like, even though it's late for you and me, it's actually super early, um, like on a, on a mass market level, especially in Australasia. Um, but I think all it takes is like, you know, a couple of couple of brands and a couple of people that are known and all blacks or whatever to begin jumping in on it. Maybe not all blacks, uh, old school as. Um, uh, I yeah. think Dan, Dan Carter's like launching one soon. I think Artie's going to do one soon. I don't know if it, what utility they have attached to it as well. It might just be a collector's item, but yeah. And is, is it, is it going to resonate with their audience? Do you know yeah. what I mean? That's like, the is the audience tech savvy? Like, is the audience like up for play and what's going on in that, in that world? They, they may be, they may not be. And that's where it's so important. Like, yeah, I'm not saying that, I'm not suggesting that they are doing this stuff, but it's jumping on the bandwagon. But it's just like, actually, it's like, oh shit, okay, this is like all this noise, but no one, none, none of my audience want to buy it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think an IRU audience, I'd say, I think it would do well. And that's not sounding, that's not sounding cocky. It's just, I know who my audience is. Like, 
they are a lot of them are similar age to me um you know they live in this kind of they live in this digi world and this is this is very part of that digi world yes it's the way forward yeah that's what i th- like when i thought nfts i just thought of you guys straight away it's just yeah. it just lines perfectly oh like like we said with trends and fashion timing's everything isn't it a- absolutely bro absolutely and as i said like you're probably getting me inspired i'm getting inspired now of, of doing it you know and we're very <laughs> You know, we're very art based as well. I was, I was, I was personally going to release. I had like a project that I was going to release. Uh, I've already got all the work and stuff. I just kind of like held, held off on it for a little bit because once again, just distraction. Like I was, I was kind of, I, you know, we've only got X amount of bandwidth, and um, I didn't want to use that little bit of bandwidth I had left for this stuff. So, but maybe I've got a few. I've got like a, I got like a page and a few. I've sold a few, and people, people love them and. You know, got got a little bit of money from it, and it was quite cool. Like just for rush, and I think the whole thing was for me. It was more of like playing, playing with it, and and understanding it. And it's that whole thing we we're saying before. It's just like you do need to play with it, and and oh, and, and yeah. start applying it. And um, and it was me. Like probably if I looked at it financially, I'd probably come out a little bit worse off yep. as opposed to gain for the NFT space. For the for the ETH space, I'm up. Um, but for NFTs, it's, yeah, a little bit down. And that's because, you know, I had to spend, you know, whatever it was, like 200 bucks, 300 bucks US for, um, you know, the mining fees and yeah, um, okay. gas fees, sorry, and all that stuff. So minting it and, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. You might do a couple of new projects here with NFTs and your third or fourth one might be the one that just goes fucking bang. Yeah, yeah, exactly, man. And I think that if you have the audience behind you, a pre-existing audience, whew, it'll be, bro, you're like straight away jump ahead of the pack, you know, because there's so much noise, like social media, so much noise. So it's like, why, why, you know, I'm a dude, I've got, you know, 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks. Why would I buy this nobody with no substance, no story, no history, no audience, when I can buy for the same price, someone with substance, with audience, where it could possibly go up in value. And I think a lot of people, um, they do see it as a store of value. And I think a store of value, you want it to go up in value. And um, so therefore, if you've got an, uh, an existing audience and you put something out, your chances are going to probably be better than the other guy that doesn't. Oh, 100%. All right. All right, V, I'm just about to wrap that up now, but I just want to say thank you for your time, your knowledge. I always appreciate these. I treat them as almost like a consulting session. You're always generous, <laughs> generous, generous with your knowledge, and I appreciate you. Easy, brother. I'll always enjoy it, man. We'll do a third one soon. Yeah, let's chop it up in about six months, and we'll just talk about NFTs and shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll be like, bro, should have taken my advice, man. <laughs> hold, your, hold your money until Jan, I reckon. Yeah, cool. I'll take your advice on it. All right, brother. Maybe. All right, as it. Appreciate it, bro. Peace. Yeah,